So thanks to everybody who's come. I'll, I'll start with a little introduction. So at least we're moving the ball forward. I am Brad Kugler, the CEO and co-founder of Direct Mail 2.0. You know, as some of you have probably been here before, we like to do monthly webinars on sort of cutting edge topics. Everybody is always hearing what's in the news or what's raising to the top in terms of, you know, the 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 buzzwords that are going around, the sound bites, the video bites. So, you know, one of my things I like to do is kind of discover more about it, see if it's applicable or how I can use it or how I can educate or even entertain people to get them to understand what's what's new and what's coming around the bend. So what I've done here is I've invited a I guess you can say a longtime friend. I've known you, John, for what, over 20 some years? 20. Yeah, close to 30 years. Oh, yeah. So, so Maybe John, more than I that. met yeah. when you lived in yeah. Tampa and uh, I was getting into selling uh, VHS and DVDs e commerce wise. And, and you guys were helping us build an e commerce site back in the late 90s, I think. It was. Right. Right. So, but uh, before the web was won. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, again, trying to stay cutting edge and get in there. But um, John kind of breaks the mold. I mean, I, I'm an older guy and I guess you can call him a middle aged guy as well. And, and, and he is extremely technology savvy, has always been on the cutting edge. And I've attended a couple of his webinars on the power of AI and how to actually use it for day to day tasks. And I was blown away with the simplicity and how direct and articulate he communicated on the subject. So I basically asked him to sort of take the lead here and, and run this, this webinar to show you guys how you can use AI right now today to improve your own business, all right? We've all maybe tried a chat GPT and asked it a few funky questions and had a off-cuff conversation, but he takes it many steps further and actually shows you how to either monetize or improve efficiency in your business from using these tools. Before I did that, I wanted to just take a few minutes. I've put together a few educational slides. Some of you guys, this may be a little bit esoteric or pedantic and it's a little boring, but a lot of us don't really know some of the basis of what is this AI and what are we doing? So I wanted to just kind of take a few minutes to go over that. And John, please, if I'm off base or I haven't said anything that makes 100% of sense, or you, please correct me, all right? Because I, I, no I, I'm a newbie at this myself. No worries. All right. So, so basically, you have these two buzzwords, AI, which stands for artificial intelligence, and ML, which stands for machine learning. And these are the things that create... I mean, a computer is not smart on its own. It's only smart to what you've taught it to do. But the new vision on this is that you can teach it to continue teaching itself by what you're feeding it. So the more data and the more questions and the feedback it gets, it can actually correct its own mistakes or learn from what it's already been given. So to some here are some basic uses that are actually happening every day with AI or machine language. Um, I, I used a service actually last month called Prenuvo. Prenuvo is a is a uh, an, a full body MRI, and what they do is you spend an hour and a half inside this thing. It takes thirty eight hundred pictures of inside your body, and through AI, because you don't want to have a cardiologist looking at these thirty eight hundred pictures for the next two weeks, the AI has been trained to spot things that may be an abnormality. And once it's spotted a few dozen things, you, you would still rely on the radiologist to make the final diagnosis. But what the AI has done is it's looked at all these pictures very quickly and it's come up with a few things that require some human input. Um, I can tell you more about that service, but it's called prenuvo.com. It's very interesting and that's a whole separate conversation. Uh, AIs can predict the failure of equipments and manufacturing lines based on stress points and, and, and usage. Uh, obviously, we've all been party to fraudulent flags in our credit card or banking usage. I'm sure there's no person in this planet that has a credit card that hasn't gotten a text or a phone call asking if this was a fraudulent uh, charge or not. The nice thing is, is that it learns from those inputs. So it knows your spending power or your spending habits, and it will adjust based on that. Um, 
obviously some things that we do know where AI has been pretty good is what Netflix recommends. I don't know if you've used TikTok, but I think it's one of the most sticky, most personalized AI pieces of code that I've ever seen. Okay. I'm not a huge social media guy, probably more than most, but that AI and TikTok shows you and learns exactly what you like. And it curates that your feed to what it knows you're interested in. And it learns fast. So that's impressive. Um, bigger companies are using it to, to predict on uh, cost cutting measures or where there's excesses or shortages in companies. And, and the big thing here is that, you know, it's becoming a financial powerhouse. So this, this AI is not going away. Either learn it or get run over by it is the way I see it. Um, these are some case studies and some research. I know, John, you, you may have had some later data. My data is a couple of years old and, and I won't read these out to you, but one of the things that stuck out to me is this last point. 75% of those surveyed say cognitive technologies will transform their business in three years or less. All right. So that means three fourths of everybody here, their entire business will be transformed. That's a big word in three years or less. So whatever you're doing now as a day-to-day -day or how your business operates in terms of its internal processes will most likely be affected in the next three years. So if that's the case, it behooves every one of us to learn something about this technology and what its uses are. All right, so again, I'm going back to teaching myself. And when I, when I study for a webinar, I, I dig in and I learn and you know I like to learn. And there's essentially two kinds of AR. There's narrow AI, and, and I'll read it to you. Narrow AI is a collection of technologies that rely on algorithms, programmatic responses to stimulate intelligence, generally with a focus on a specific task, like an Alexa or a Siri. You ask it questions, it decodes what you said, and it gives you some sort of a response, all right? And like the other thing I, I told you, too. And then there's a general intelligence, okay? General intelligence is something that is open up to almost anything. You, know, you can ask chat GPT about almost anything and it will come back with some sort of a, I don't want to say a perfect response, but a sequitur response. And when I say sequitur, it's relational to what's being talked about. In other words, if you ask chat GPT, you know, how's the weather today? It doesn't tell you about a type of car. It, it, it is, it will respond in like to what you're asking, whether it's correct 100% of the time, that is an, an entirely different debate that we can have. There's a very good book called Crossing the Chasm, which I read, and John, I'm, I'm sure you've heard of this book as well. I've read it. <laughs> a, anybody involved in technology, there's an adoption curve. When I say adoption curve, when new technology comes out, certain people, mostly like John and then followed by guys like me are, are considered the innovators and the early adopters. I, I would, you know, and if I've got you wrong, I would put John here at the two and a half percent of innovators in this type of technology. I would call myself one of the 13.5% early adopters. Would you agree with that? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure where you are, but I'm definitely uh, one of the really early adopters. You, you, so. I, I, I'm, an, I'll, I'm one of the 13%. Right. Yeah, and then, then it, it kind of rolls out, and I would still say most of the world is still in that early adopter stage. We have not crossed into this early majority by any sense of the face. Um, if you want to correlate this to some older technology like um, buying online, if you go back to when John and I first met 20 plus years ago, it was only early adopters or innovators that actually purchased online. It was people were still afraid to put their credit cards in. They were afraid to trust these web interfaces that, that delivered something to your house in so many days. It wasn't really well used. But now we're, we're definitely in the bottom end of that e-commerce buying curve, I would say. That anybody who's not doing it now is a laggard. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, asking us may not be the right one because we're we're towards the, the entry of that uh, chasm. Uh, the other thing is, is, you know, where did the challenges come? And this is where I'm going to try to relate it to your businesses. All right. So what are the points that 
are barriers to the adoption of this. And this, this slide will give you an example of that. Obviously, the skill level or the, I don't even call it the skill level because I don't know that the skill level is the barrier. It's, it's the willingness for the user to learn and understand what this technology is. This is not something that is so esoteric that the average man in the street cannot learn it, all right? John will prove that to you today that it's not a difficult thing to use. Now, like anything else, there's expert users and there's entry level users, but everybody can use this technology if they can speak or type. Um, the fear of it, you know, people are, are fear of change and the unknown, so they they tend to just shy away from it. I I can I won't name numerous members of my family who won't touch this stuff just because they have a fear of it and what it, what it will do or end the world or some of this stuff. Uh, that is not my viewpoint, but that is a viewpoint shared by many. You know, where do you start and who do you contact? Well, where do you start? Start by teaching yourself. Who do you contact? Contact guys like John, you know, who, who's got a firm handle on this and some experience. By the way, if there's questions, please put them into the chat. I will um, be answering those or forwarding them as we go on, but I'm, I'll finish this little preamble before that. Okay, so the next slide, this is, this is a, I don't want to get too deep into this because AI is like a large subject. Uh, if you talk about a, a large industry like printing or marketing, it, it's so diverse and so deep and at so many levels that there's, you know, how can you really be an expert at exactly one thing? This thing called AI will, will mimic that. There will be so many sectors and so many niches within this that it's hard for some one person to call them in itself a true expert across every possible scenario. If anybody wants these slides, we will send them with a copy of this, by the way, as well. Um, what's the future here? I, I'm, I'm showing some economic uh, valuations in terms of the value of some of these things that are coming down the pike, you know, and where this technology will influence your day-to-day -day life. Uh, some of this is pretty obvious. Some of this, we've only just begun to scratch the surface and I'm guaranteeing there will be uses that have not even been thought of yet, all right? Uh, I once heard somebody talk and I'm trying to remember who it was, that by the time our grandchildren, well, depending on how old you are, your great-grandchildren are able to drive, they will ask questions of us, older generation, that will basically say, did you guys actually drive cars? Because the thought is that we will just get into a car or a pod or whatever it is, and it will take us to our destination. There will be no need to actually drive a car. I fully believe that that will happen. And I, I believe it'll happen in, in our lifetimes, all right? And it'll become so commonplace that our grandchildren or great-grandchildren will wonder why we ever drive drove cars. Would you agree with that, John? I mean, that was something that- I, I think was... it's possible, but I'm hoping I'll be dead by then because I like <laughs> driving. <laughs> I do too. And of course, the, you'll still be able to drive a car, but it'll be kind of like, why why drive? Like, right. how often do you see manual transmissions anymore? Even mm -hmm. in the, the most fancy cars that are sports-driven cars, the computers- do a much more efficient and better job at shifting gears than any human can do. So uh, you have to actually request a manual transmission in some of the most fancy cars these days. You can't even get it in some of the makes and models. So we'll see. Um, this is sort of a, a lead in or a segue as we move more into chat GPT and, and what is it and, and why is it valuable, all right? So first thing, 100 million users in five days, this thing got, okay? That, that I believe that still is a record, you know, when, when Instagram came out with their threads and they automatically basically signed up 100 million people in one day. I don't know if that counts because if you had a Instagram account and you clicked a button, you automatically became a user of threads. I was one of those. I've never opened the application yet, but I'm considered one of those users. So- I would I would still give that award to ChatGPT. Um, I immediately got the paid version after playing around with it. 
And we built our own little API to the back end of our intranet in the company so that everybody can use it here and hopefully get familiar with it. But I'm a believer in it. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to save the most of this slide here for, uh, John's little chat, but, you know, and, and one final thing, these are the different list of AI platforms that are kind of the most used or most common. I keep this on a little tab next to my desk so that if I have it just as a tool to know who to go to or what, uh, platform to go to if it's a specific thing, because as these, these different AI platforms get more and more specialized, there will be better ones for specific tasks. So again, John, if you want to comment on any of your experience on any of these, I think I've only used two or three of them. Yeah, I've used almost every one of those. The only one I haven't used is Framer and Baby AGI. Those are the only two I haven't used. But I've I've played around with all of them. I I, I take it back. Llama two. I haven't played around with that. It's Facebook's thing. I'm I don't know. Not a fan. But uh, some of these we're going to go through today in blistering speed. So yeah, great, uh, great. That's well, all good stuff. Uh, let me see. Is there is there? I'm going to stop the uh, share for a second here. I want to see if there's any questions or anything. Um, that should be gone over before anything in the chat. Not yet. Where, where did my chat go? <laughs> I don't know, but there's okay. nothing in it on my end. So I think you're, you're all right. Gone. There was, but it's gone now. But okay. All right. No problem. John, I am turning it over to you. And all right, sir. I will jump in if I find the chat and there's any questions. All right. <laughs> That'd be great. All right. So I am now sharing my screen and uh, I'm going to be swiping through a whole lot of stuff. So um, the first thing I wanted to do is just kind of uh, frame this up. Well, first of all, uh, Brad and I, as he mentioned, we go way back. Now, I, uh, for the last 25 years, have had a software development company, which gradually turned into a digital marketing agency. And I sold the agency part off last year to become essentially an AI uh, consultant and coach for, for marketers and for businesses that are trying to leverage AI to grow their businesses and to improve processes, and especially to improve results when it comes to marketing and sales. So some of the things that I thought were really interesting in terms of statistics, and I'll try to go through those, uh, but I, I kind of call this the state of AI. So it's they're simpler stats than what uh, Brad just went through, but the interesting thing is businesses leveraging AI have seen a 61% reduction in costs and a 53% increase in revenue. That's according to McKinsey, and that's a pretty new stat. So this is all 2023 stuff for the most part. 84% of marketing organizations are currently implementing or expanding AI this year. And companies that use AI for sales were able to increase their leads by more than 50%, reduce call time by 60 to 70%, and reduce cost redu or realize cost reductions of 40 to 60%. That's big impact. And then three out of four C-suite executives believe that if they don't scale AI in the next five years, they risk going out of business. And that, you know, when Brad was showing you that trailing edge of the late adopters, the, the late adopters here in my business risk really truly going out of business. So this thing is moving faster than anything I've ever witnessed. And so you have to get on board and you have to really do it quickly. I know I talked that uh, at the beginning that I was going to give you five actionable AI strategies. I'm going to try to squeeze in seven and... We'll see how many we can actually demonstrate. So I'm going to try to go through all seven of these and show you some of the tools that you can use. If I have time, I'll swipe through all this and show you how some of these things work. Um, so first, you want to be able to use it to accelerate and improve direct response copywriting. So in order to, uh, to develop a conversion, and let's just talk about if, if most of the audience are printers and you're helping your, your clients print things and they they want some sort of response back for it. You're going to need to learn how to write direct response copywriting style. If you're doing direct mail, if you're doing email, if you're trying to generate leads for your own business, direct response is, is what you need because in today's world, 
most people, and it's way over 86% now, or they're going to have their first interaction with you online, right? Even if they got something in the mail from you, their next move is to try to avoid a salesperson. So they're going to go to your website. They're going to do something. And that website or that material that you direct mailed needs to speak to them like your best salesperson would. So it needs to feel like a conversation. And that's where you have to become a student of direct response copywriting. Here's the problem, though. 90% of the stuff that's written out there is not direct response copywriting. And that means that all the AI tools out there essentially have been schooled or educated on all of the copy that's out there. So 90% of what is in there is wrong when it comes to direct response copywriting. So that means you need to know how to spot it and use it. So out of all these tools, ChatGPT, Claude, Copy.ai, Jasper, there, there are plenty of others. Claude, I really like. I like the way it writes copy. You still need to tweak a little bit, but it writes pretty good copy. If you know how to do the right prompts in ChatGPT, you can get it to write good copy as well. All right. So before we kind of dive into some of these things, there's one other thing that you really need to know. And this is another one of those hacks. This is why I'm, I'm saying I got seven of these things. But what you really need is you need to create a scalable prompting system, which means, you know, a lot of people, you can go on YouTube, you can go anywhere and you can just uh, see all these little prompts that people write. Those are what I would call beginner prompts. Those aren't scalable inside of your organization. So somebody will just write a big old question and then the next thing you know, they threw that one away and they have a new use case and it's similar. So they have to write the prompt all over again, finesse it and try to figure it out. That's not scalable. So what I do is, and I'll, I'll see if I can fan through this real quick, um, holler at me if you are seeing my, my screen still, right? I'm swiping. You see the prompt database now, Brad? Okay, good. Just want to make sure. Okay, so this is how we store all of our prompts. And if you've never used Notion, I mean, the good news Notion is free. Of course, there are paid versions. We have a paid version, a team version, so we share it inside the organization. But what we do is we'll write all of our prompts down here and we'll sift through them, you know, we, we organize them. Um, I think I have some kind of a search going on here. Yeah. So this makes it really easy to really get after the, the prompts. So you test it, you refine it, and you can see here we have different stages. In fact, we even have a view where we can go through uh, and you can see it in a production schedule. So you can see all the prompts that we are working on or that we actually have published. But once they're published and they're useful, I like, for instance, this one. This is where we'll have a meeting like this one, and we'll have an AI tool that records the meeting. And you've probably seen a, a, a bunch of those. There's Fathom, and there's Meet Geek, and there's uh, Otter, and, and Fireflies. We tested them all out. Which is the best? I'm curious, because I've been considering one of those. I yeah. still take handwritten so, notes in meetings. Well, we did a whole... Um, AI roundtable on that last week. And I put probably 60 hours in analyzing all that. And they're all, uh, they all have pros and cons. I use Fathom. I, I like it. Um, it's none of them are really super accurate. And that was the problem, but um, we'll take the transcript and we'll use this prompt. Now there are two things to, to creating a prompt, a scalable prompt. One is we call it stacked prompting, prompting, okay? So I wanna have these variables up here that I can swap in and out. So if I have a new problem that I'm trying to solve, I don't wanna have to write all this stuff all over again. I just wanna have it, paste it and swap out stuff. So if I'm writing for somebody else, else I'm gonna swap out the name over there. If I want a different style, like I'm writing an email, it needs to be a little less formal. I can swap out some of these things. So like I could crank up the humor level if I want, <clears throat> or I can crank it down. Um, and then what I'm gonna do is- Can I ask this a question? Is, just yes, so that, cause it's, I think other people may have the same question as me. When you say you create the variable, this let's pick any one of these that are in, the, in between the, the bars. 
um, the first one, author. Is, uh -huh. is that variable a known variable by, I'm assuming, chat GPT that knows that, or, or you're creating that variable and assigning I'm creating this. Okay. Chat GPT knows these. Okay. I ha We have a prompt inside of here that actually solves for these. So I can take a piece of copy. I can analyze it and say, how is this written? And it will give me all of these. And so it'll that's tell a me to what that degree. We'll do that analyzation, right? Is that a no? Plug it's in? stuff we wrote. Okay. Yeah, it's stuff we wrote. Um, so this is this is literally a prompt that we created, right? Now, if you were to go to something like Copy AI or Jasper AI, you can't really use a lot of this because they already have it kind of built in. Which is why I like ChatGPT because it it doesn't have as many walls as the other ones. So I'll use it to fine tune what I want. But this is the actual meat of the prompt here where we're actually telling it to analyze the transcript and then I want it to pull out any recommendations or requests that were made by anybody. Uh, we have a follow-up prompt where it'll actually create a to-do list and an email and the email that goes out is a different you know, tone or style depending upon who's sending out the email. So when I'm finished with a meeting, my uh, executive assistant, Kelly, she will take the transcript, process it, and then she'll send out emails to everybody that says, here's what was discussed, here's, here are the action items, and here's what you do. Now, some of these tools, like Fireflies, tries to accomplish that inside of it with its own AI. The problem is, if the transcript isn't perfect, then the to-do list isn't going to be perfect. So we, we like to go in and clean it up. But this process of what we call stacked prompt and prompting and variable prompting really speeds things up. So now anybody in my organization can go down here. Like for instance, if we're gonna do a competitive analysis uh, for one of our clients, we have a seven step process. I don't wanna to have to do that all over again, right? Uh, and I don't want all of our team guessing. So they just know what the process is, you know, and the first step of the process is this where we're starting to solve for you know who's the niche who's the avatar what are their fears their mistaken beliefs and all that stuff so we want to understand who that is and we paste in their url and it'll read you know we could paste in a number of urls and it'll actually pull all that data down this is all using chat gpt but you can see up here in the prompt library we said okay you got to use webpilot and seo uh, core AI. Those are the two plugins that are required to make this thing work. So hopefully you can see why building a prompt database is really critical to you scaling as an organization and using AI. All right. Now, um, let me go into the other one. So if you want to boost your your results from direct mail or from email, there's several AI tools that will help you do that. Um, I don't know. Have you ever heard of Line.ai? I, I, this is the first time I'm hearing of it now. So you know. Okay. Uh, well, so if I if I create uh, if I take Line, and Line will actually look up somebody's profile inside of LinkedIn, look for something that's that's current, relevant, or interesting, and that will you you, you use that code in your opening line in your email or in direct mail, and it'll say like, since I went to LSU. I get a lot of it. It goes, hey, John, see you went to LSU, go Tigers, right? So it's an icebreaker, <clears throat> but it's all driven by AI. And it's pretty cool, you know? So there, there are a couple other tools that do the same thing. But if you're trying to get better responses, one of the best things that you can do is establish some level of rapport at the opening line, right? <clears throat> and it makes sense. And then when you're looking at using something like direct mail 2.0, right? If, if somebody else is printing it and that's going out there and now somebody's reading the opening line, you know, Brad's company tracks it all from a direct mail standpoint, like we would want to be looking at it from an email standpoint. So there's a lot of fascinating tools you can use to get better results from your campaigns. Now, Brad, I don't know whether you want to step in and talk about it real quick, but uh, I, I want to give you the time. I mean, okay. they've heard enough from, from me and our DM20, and I'm sure if they have questions, they can ask us. They or can ask. We'll find them. Right. We will tell we'll them. keep rolling. Yeah, keep we'll rolling. We'll keep rolling. Yeah. Uh, okay. The other thing is is just, 
you know, um, one of the things that drives me nuts when I'm putting a presentation like this together or anything else is the artwork. I am not a graphic designer. All right. So I, if I were going to do this last year, I would have spent hours going through some of these um, photo libraries like 123RF or Adobe uh, images. I'd be going hours and hours just trying to match images with the topics of the slides. But with AI, I can go and actually create them. So this particular image behind this was created using Midjourney and Photoshop. And I'm going to show you just actually how it was constructed too. So this this was the mid-journey prompt that created this image, okay? A light bulb symbolizing creativity, the center of which is an icon. Now, that sounds pretty, like you probably, especially when it gets into the composition, it's shot with a Nikon D850. It's got an f-stop of 1.8, a resolution of 40, you know, blah, blah, blah. You think I know that stuff? No. I, I use chat GPT to generate that. So there's a plugin in ChatGPT called Photorealistic, and I just turn it on. I go, hey, give me some ideas. I tell ChatGPT, and it's, a, it's another one of our prompts in the library, which is called the image uh, generator based on an idea. I plug that prompt in. It comes up with the idea. It writes this prompt. I paste it into MidJourney. It creates this image. Then I go over here to Photoshop, and I have to show you the step-by-step -step on this. Whoops, hang on a second. Uh, yeah. This is where he shows us he's like a jack of all trades here. He's got yeah, man. AI prompt engineer. He's got the Photoshop digital graphics. Yeah. I'm gonna try to zoom this up just so that you can see. And eh, probably got it a little bit too high. Whoops. Okay. So you can see that it's just a light bulb, right? But when you look at it, it I didn't, it, I, I, I told it to make it at, at 16 by nine, but I wanted this to be a banner inside of our um, community and it needed to be longer than that. Okay. So then what I did was I used this little function in Photoshop called generative fill. And I said, look, I just need you to fill in the background. Oh, uh, it, actually, let me show you what I did. I had it create this, this uh, brain. <clears throat> All right. And let me see if it, uh, fooey, I guess it won't, um, it won't quite say it. It used to tell me what the prompt was, but it, I don't, it's not seeing it. But anyway, I just told it, I said, instead of that filament, I, I circled this area and I said, replace it with a, a, a brain that looks AI ish. And it did it. It just totally did it. And then I had it fill in the sides, you know just using generative fill and it created that. I'm like, damn, right. that's really cool. Yeah. You know, so that's pretty slick. All right, so then um, you can use other tools like, whoops, hang on a minute, like in video, and I, I won't walk you through that because we're gonna run out of time, but in video is fascinating. I actually took a, a, a friend of mine who has a printing company in New Orleans, I copied and pasted the about us section and something about direct mail uh, printing on there. And I pasted it into NVIDIA. And three minutes later, it created a two minute YouTube short with real video clips. It, and and uh, it wrote its own script, which was really pretty good. And I had it use an uh, uh, AI voice and most of the time, you know, it, it sounds crappy, but it literally said, do you want a Southern accent? I'm like, yeah, they're in New Orleans. Boom. Yes. Well, it picked footage from New Orleans. It picked footage from printing shops. It picked uh, photos of, you know, envelopes and stuff. Wrote a really good script. And the voice, I was like, it actually sounded like somebody narrated it. So I thought it was really cool. Now, I've heard it can be buggy if you overuse it, but it was a great tool. Three minutes, I had a YouTube short. That's Steve, amazing. Yeah, it is. Steve does. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say, I've, I've got a couple of questions. One was somebody asking, I'm curious, where do you find all of these tools, plugins, and websites? How do you stay current? Is there is there one or two places that you would recommend that us laymen 
check into once in a while to sort of stay current on this stuff? Well, the, uh, trying to stay current with plugins is, is nuts. I mean, when we started looking at plugins, there were like 40 of them. Now there are over 800, I think. You know, wow. last number I heard was six to 800. So um, I know that ChatGPT, it will eventually make it so that it's better. You can search now, which is cool. You used to not be able to search. So you just go up there and you type in a keyhole or a keyhole. Listen to me. I just read the text. Talk about a rabbit hole. Yes, it is. <laughs> but you you go in there. Yeah. And Bob Miller's right. Endless time digging around. Exactly. Um, but I'm like, I was looking for something specific. Like I was going to do some research on something. So I just keyed in some uh, stuff on research or statistics and boom, it tells me all the plugins to use. If I was going to use videos, boom, it would tell me. Now, there are other tools in there that will actually find an AI that, um, for you. Uh, that's it's a there are two of them that I know of, and you would literally just enable those plugins and you say, okay, find me some AI tools that'll do X. It'll do it. Now, the only thing I will tell you is the this is clearly an affiliate program, so they've got affiliate arrangements with everything that that'll find, and some of these are some no name tools, but. It's how I found Steve.ai and Visla, uh, which was kind of interesting. So Steve does animation. So instead of it being a video, Steve will write its own script and it'll create animation and it's cool. Um, Visla, uh, it, Visla will take a blog post. I can give it the URL of a blog post and Visla will turn around and make a video out of it with a script and everything. It's amazing. And we did that in one of our round tables. I see Bob's Bob's hyping me up. Bob got my hype man with me. <laughs> um, but yeah, we did it in the middle of one of the round tables. Uh, and I'll show you how you can get access to all those replays uh, if you want to. Munch will take a video and it'll crop it out. Like if you have a, a 30 minute video, like maybe this, if you had the transcript of, or not the transcript, but you had the video feed of this, you could throw it into Munch and Munch will use AI to try to find one minute or two minute segments that you can turn into TikTok videos and it'll compress it, cut it's it and brilliant. put all the titles on it. And yeah, I, I just want to double that plug crazy. that because anybody that needs to be prevalent these days has to be on social media and to be on social media and not have to hire a content manager, a tool like Munch, I mean, could save you tens of thousands of dollars for creating this content. I've never used yeah. it, but I guarantee you this is one I'm going to go and, and, and try right but away. If you have the right original video, it'll do a good job. If, if you don't, it's a little sus. You know, okay. but um, hey, they're only going to get better is the way I, I see it. So I'm I'm a fan. Um, now, the other thing you want to look at is how do you fine tune your lead quality? Right. So there are tools out there that will help you do that. Apollo.io is one of the ones that we use. And I'll give you a for instance on Apollo. Let me see if I can actually pull it up. Yeah, here we go. <clears throat> In Apollo. You just go search for people. It'll find, you know, anybody that you want over here. And I had a, a situation where I, I wanted to buy some software from somebody. And another buddy of mine said, I, I don't know how to reach them, you know, and I didn't want to wait because they they <clears throat> they make you wait and go have a, a call, right? So they can hook you and sell you. And I'm like, dude, I, 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 I want to have it today. I don't want to have to go wait a week to go visit a sales guy who's going to, I, so, so I just used this to look up the owner. I got his cell phone out of here and I called him on his cell phone and he's like, yeah, sure. I'll set you up. I can set you up today. I'm like, cool. Uh, and it was cool because what the software generated, I had already pre-sold to somebody uh, five days later. <clears throat> so I needed to have access it, uh, to it right away. So it really worked. Now they have this new thing over here called buying intent. And what it does is like, if you were to say, I, I'm, I'm looking for somebody who is looking for digital marketing services, this theoretically will look at it and say, they are currently exhibiting buying intent. So is it similar to seamless? Yes. Um, I was just gonna ask. I was yeah. just <clears throat> Yes. Um, so, but I, this buyer's intent, I mean, here's the thing, I, I haven't found it accurate or useful yet because i'm i'm a little maybe too narrow like if if i were uh looking 
if I were looking for um, a car dealership, right, I would want to find people who are exhibiting behavior to buy uh, a car, right? Um, yeah, sort of similar to Zoom. Zoom is a much broader. Apollo is really uh, the majority of their stuff comes straight out of, of LinkedIn, but it's all cool stuff. All right. So now swinging back here, Woodpecker uh, is another one, but Woodpecker is, is now beta testing a new feature, which is actually really cool. What it'll do is, uh, in, and there's several uh, tools that'll do it out here, but Woodpecker from the beta that I have seen, does it better than anybody I've seen. And it will take a clip of you, Brad, where you could just say, uh, you could record yourself saying, hey, I went through your website. I understand a lot about your business. I, I know that we can help you do X, Y, or Z better, right? But the first part of it is just where you go, hey, you know, so-and-so, right? And then and you can green screen it. So behind you, you might have uh, the picture of their website or whatever. Well, all it's going to do is use AI and it's going to take your database and it'll it'll have you saying, hey, John, hey, Michelle, hey, uh, Bob, hey, Jeff, uh, hey, whatever. And your lips will move at the right uh, thing to actually say that person's name, no matter how weird the, the name is. And it really does a good job. Uh, so that's a new tool that they're they're coming out. I've, like I said, I've seen others, but this one allows you to do it at scale. So you literally could just, just email out and somebody's going to see a little clip of you going, hey, John, you know, and, and maybe something in the background that makes them go, oh, he is looking at my website. That's crazy. Right. Um, mm -hmm. These two are chat bots. All right. Hello, Tars, live person. There's several others. They're AI based chat bots. Um, I have a friend who's actually, what you're going to find with these chatbots, they're going to have to niche down. And I have a friend who's actually creating a chatbot specifically for uh, ophthalmology clinics. Okay. So that's really narrow. <clears throat> Some of these, I, I, they just need a little bit more education, in my opinion, because what I see, uh, it, it's not much better than the old press one for this, press two for that. You know, if they haven't built the right decision tree, you end up with, I'm sorry, I didn't under understand the question. So they're going to get better. Um, there's, in my view, they, there's still a little golf left uh, on these. So then you can use ChatGPT and other tools to help you craft winning proposals. Now, in our roundtable, and I think, you know, Bob, my hype man, he could probably tell you which one it was. I think it was like three or four ago. And so you, you can hop in and catch the replay. But at the end of it, my buddy, uh, who has the printing company in New Orleans, uh, he had sent me, I asked him, I said, hey, uh, Paul, I got this uh, customer and here's what I need. Here's the database. I, give me just ballpark it so I can get it into the budget for next year. What it would cost to do direct mail for all this stuff. He sends me this reply that was a stack thing, all these different variables and uh, stuff. And I was like, oh man, I can't, I can't read this. So I just took the whole thing shoved it into chat GPT and turned on the code interpreter. If you, if you're familiar with how that works, but I turned on code interpreter and I told chat GPT, can you just put this in the table? So I understand it. It put it in the table and I'm like, okay, cool. Can you make it into a spreadsheet that I can download? Boom. I downloaded the spreadsheet. And then I started looking at it. I was like, you know, the average um, sale, uh, if we're going to do this is, $3,500. So I then went to chat GPT and I said, if the average sale is, is $3,500 and I want you to calculate an ROI for me on this proposal. And it, it starts going through all these gyrations and it calculated the ROI. And so, uh, you know, in the show, you'll see, I, I told uh, Paul, I was like, Paul, you should be using this to sell right? I shouldn't have to use it to buy from you. But if you turn around and you use chat GPT to tell somebody what the ROI would be, now all of a sudden they're like, oh, this is actually believable, right? And so there's a whole lot that you can do with that. I, I'm a huge fan of using it to make your prospect's life easier. But what it forces you to do is understand your prospect's pains and problems better, right? And I just happen to know, since this is my client, I know what the pains and problems are, and I know what their average uh, 
uh, deal size is. I know what the lifetime value of a customer is. I know what their current cost to acquire a customer is. So I just gave it to ChatGPT and I said, now tell me what the ROI is. Whole different ball game. All right. Um, and then, of course, this is where it gets really tricky. Now, I haven't played with any of these tools, but I looked at them and they look like they're pretty amazing. So customer analytics, for instance, pecan.ai can help you understand if you, and, and this is what we're going to be using for one of my clients. If your client is buying product X, there's a high likelihood that they will also buy products Y and Z, you know? So that is really helpful, right? If I could analyze, and this particular client has like uh, two, 3,000 customers and they do, I don't know, 20,000 transactions a year, that's a lot of data. This would be a perfect tool because what we're trying to do is say, in this data, is there gold, right? Is there a, a type of customer that we should be targeting where we could really do better, but we, we don't know because it's just one little customer out of all of them, right? Well, can Supply I ask chain question? analytics. Yes, sir. I, I, so obviously all of these things require some sort of input or some sort of tie into the uh, user's database in order to analyze this data. So as an example with the customer analytics, I'm assuming that you have to feed it some data. Where and how do you get this data into Pecan to get the output that is so valuable? Yeah, um, I, that's a good question because I haven't used it, but my assumption would be there's an API that you're just going to tie in so they can pull the data. If not, um, I know that you can export in most systems, which is what we're going to try to do. The thing that I, I want to make sure of, and Pecan, it seems to have uh, laid my fears to rest, is I want to make sure that when I put that data in there, it's not available for the rest of the world. And it's not going to educate their AI on our secret sauce, right? So that's what I want to make sure of, that I can operate inside of a closed system when I give it tight data like that. Right. And throughput.world I thought was really fascinating. You know, I don't know whether you're familiar with it, but it will anticipate problems in the supply chain based on weather patterns, based on any number of things. Um, so it's pretty fascinating if you really rely on uh, a lot from your supply chain, right? If you're doing uh, a whole lot. Like right now, if you look out Brad's window, you'll see a hurricane approaching and that could mess up somebody's supply chain, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, and business automation, uipath.com has some really cool stuff too. Highly recommend you checking it out. Uh, but yes, we will. Uh, I'll, I'll give you the slide deck as well when we're finished. So um, now that we're kind of coming to the close, I, I did want to at least give you these these links because I know Bob has been talking about it. If you want to get access to our replays, you can also uh, become part of the uh, the roundtable if you want. If you just go to bazooka.com slash replays, then you can request access to it. You'll you'll get into the community and you'll be able to see all of the um, all of the replays in there. We're preparing the prompt database. The thing that I showed you way over here. In to Notion to swipe. Yeah. yeah, the Notion base. So what we're doing is we're preparing this uh, in a manner that we can give to people. So there'll be a free version and there'll be a, a paid version as well because we have thousands of hours in this beast. Uh, but that's really helpful for people. So if you want to have access to that when it's ready, hopefully it'll be ready next week. You can just go to bazooka.com slash prompts and fill that out. So either way of the, uh, either way you can do that. And Jim Stewart, um, how do you connect with me? Um, let's, uh, let's say, well, you go to bazooka.com and fill out one of the contact forms. Or let's see, I don't know. If I type anything in here, it'll go to everybody, right? You have to select the, pull down the little thing and make sure it says everyone, then it will go to everyone. But John, why don't you tell people, I mean, how do you make money? How, how, what do you do for people? And, and do you do you engage in consulting oh, arrangements? Bob, Bob, Bob even knows how to contact me. He, he, he must work for you or something. <laughs> or you. I don't know, but Bob is, is definitely... Uh, Bob, leading Bob, the charge here. He's worth the paycheck today. Yeah. No, I, you know, I wish he was on my payroll. Yeah. 
Uh, so what is it that you do and what services do you provide since there's already people asking? Yeah. So, well, what I do is I work with businesses to help them implement AI in their marketing and sales efforts, right? So that's what I try to do. I try to help them learn how to scale, learn how to use it to innovate, learn how to use it to market better. So that's essentially what I do. So I also act as a fractional CMO for companies, but right now I'm at capacity for that. So I, I'm, I'm really, uh, I have more room on the coaching side, which is why I recommend that you join the, the round table. So if you want to uh, communicate with us inside the round table, that would be the best way to reach me, I, I think. Would you consider yourself, I mean, you, you hear of these new job titles that are, or industry services that are coming on the market as prompt engineers and AI interface sort of technicians. Is, is that something you would label yourself in some way or not? Well, really? not in the truest sense, because a, a prompt engineer is going to be somebody who's actually working um, using the API. If I, uh, 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 that gets really technical. But if, if you're what you're trying to do as a, as a true prompt engineer is you're trying to take your software and you're trying to integrate it with an AI uh, and have that thing go across. I'm I'm more of a prompt uh, strategist, but I'm a prompt engineer from the front end because that's you know you saw how complicated some of these prompts are. That's what I do, and I help businesses create really customized and scalable prompts internally because I know most businesses don't have the tool set to work on the back end using an API, but they have people who could use the front end, right? So that's what I, I help them do. Uh, I'm just trying to throw out examples here of what, what I would say most of the people on this call are, are in the commercial printing industry or um, in terms of talking to them, they're always trying, you know, a, a printer is essentially a manufacturer. They are actually... Yeah producing a physical good and delivering it to market. Um, what what would be some immediate, have you ever had any experience doing, working in manufacturing in terms of assisting efficiency or in that aspect, or is that? Well, so um, speaking of printing, uh, I, I cut my teeth in a print shop in college. I ran a Heidelberg Whirly Bird uh, for for those who know what that is, so I ran a letterpress machine for uh, four years. So I was in there back in the day when the uh, there was actually a position called typesetter, and uh, and they were doing paste ups and all those other stuff that color separation words we don't right, use anymore. <laughs> right, that's right. Before color seps, go oh my gosh, yeah. So um, I haven't since I'm primarily marketing, I haven't actually worked with a business to try to analyze all that stuff and analyze workflows and try to streamline that. So that's not my, you know, uh, my bailiwick as it were. But what I do know is how printers, you know, make money and need to generate leads and need to impress upon their clients how they can do that. Creativity, because like sometimes you know, you get your you get your artwork and all that stuff from an agency. But a lot of times somebody just comes in and works with you directly and says, okay, I need y'all to do the creative. Well, that's where AI could really help because sometimes, look, from a guy who's not an artist, I can tell you, uh, AI created every one of the images that you saw on this presentation. So every single one of them, was done by mid journey where the the prompt was either something I thought of but 90% of them were prompts that I you know prompted chat gpt to think through so like if i took uh one of these slides and i just i literally posted in it uh, saying, give me a, give me some suggestions for maximizing profitability with ai and so it was like okay here are three suggestions you know and i did it for the other ones as well so anyway, it, like this thing, I said, uh, make a futuristic boardroom table, a round one. Okay. Comes up with that. So anyway, I mean, that, that, that's, that's the kind great. of stuff. And, yeah. and I'll tell you why that even saves money is because if you go, well, you shouldn't be doing this, but I know people do it. You just steal an image from Google and somebody else's copyrighted image. It could be a problem. Uh, if you go to a stock image company and, and search for that image, you have to pay a fee in most cases. 
But yeah. if an AI creates it from a prompt, it is royalty free as far as I know, and no mm -hmm. copyright infringement. Am, am I correct in that statement? Um, some of them are telling you you can't use it for business purposes now. You have to look at the fine print. Like for instance, one two three RF dot com has uh, an AI image generator. It's uh, suspect. You know, it's not really ready for prime time. It does some interesting things, but it's not nearly the quality of Mid Journey. But when you create it, it tells you, okay, you can use this, but but you can't use it for business purposes yet or commercial well, that's, purposes. That's good to know. I mean, that's that's helpful. Yeah. So. Well, and now they, I think the feds just laid down the law that said you can't own the copyrights of an AI generated image, which is interesting, you know, uh, because like when, you know, you look at that little light bulb that I created using a combination of things. I kind of like that. I think it's pretty cool. Uh, I do too. But I imagine somebody will, you know, it'll, I'll see it somewhere else one day. <clears throat> right. Or, or somebody can vary it by a, a few pixels and then is it really yeah. the same? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, using Photoshop, like I, I took a picture of my backyard for one of these episodes and I could take a picture of the backyard and I could remove chairs that are in the way. I can swap out plants. I can put flowers on bushes and I could put a, a, a raft in the middle of the swimming pool through all through Photoshop and it looks amazing in literally just a plug in with Photoshop or where no, it's, get... it's the new one. It's the, it's the beta version of, of, of Photoshop that you, I think is, what do they call it? Do they call it Firefly or something like that. Anyway, if you can get it, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's really, really cool. And you just tell it to remove stuff. I, I literally highlighted kind of like the, the backdrop because my neighbor is, is, adding on to his house. There's a whole lot of construction. Then there's my fence. I just kind of highlighted around. I said, make it a beach scene. All of a sudden, <laughs> I was like, I was going to have a beach view. <laughs> so it's pretty cool. Wow. That's fantastic. So, you know, yeah. I want to be respectful of everybody's time. We've got about two minutes on our, our predetermined hour. So uh, I want to see if there's any last questions. I want to make sure that everybody knows that we will send around recording of this. It will include John's deck, and my deck. And um, obviously, I, I encourage anybody to reach out to John. Uh, his, his email and contact information will be forwarded to you as well. And take advantage of this time and don't fall behind. Don't be a laggard. All right. And uh, learn something here. I, I was very, I mean, we could have gone on all afternoon, you know, but uh, obviously we can't. So yeah. um, thank you yeah, very much. If John, I could have actually, uh... If I could have gone in there and actually typed some of this out to spit it out, your your head would explode. It's really I know. Really I've nice. seen you do it, and, and <laughs> I understand we're short for time. But it's it's important that everybody stays at least aware of this technology, that it's out there. I know that it could be a bit overwhelming to learn it and use it immediately. But stay connected. Stay aware. And if you want to take advantage of this, please reach out and contact John. John, I, I uh, appreciate it very much. And uh, I thank you. you. So, all right, thank you. Let everybody go and have enjoy the rest of your day while us Floridians go and uh, secure our homes. All right, guys. All right. Bye bye. Take care. Thanks. Bye bye.